First of all, you may notice that the story of creation, the fall of man, and indeed the whole of Genesis is probably the most contentious book of the Bible, the one that is attacked most regularly and with the most venom. This is because Genesis, particularly chapters 1 to 11, is the foundation upon which the rest of the Bible is built. The creation story, the fall of man, Satan's role in it, and how the nations were birthed are fundamental to our understanding of the world we live in. This is why it is so unpopular with that fallen world. If it can be undermined or disproved in any way, the rest of the Bible would be discredited, just as a building would collapse without its secure foundation. However, what happened in the Garden of Eden has a very real impact on the world today. After Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan's offer to become as gods through secret knowledge, sin entered into the world which became cursed with death. God pronounced several judgments on all concerned, curses that would affect all their descendants for the rest of time. He says to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the first of hundreds of Old Testament prophecies that refer to Jesus Christ. God had already set in place a plan of redemption whereby the offspring of a human woman would crush the serpent's head but would be bruised in the process. Adam and Eve went on to have two sons called Cain and Abel. Cain killed his younger brother in a fit of jealousy and was thereafter banished from the Garden of Eden by God. The Garden of Eden, incidentally, is described by scripture to have been located in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, which would place it in the area we now refer to as Iraq. After his expulsion, Cain is noted to have set about becoming a builder of cities and is thereafter always associated with the evil one. The rebellion of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden marked the start of a severe decline into depravity and perversion for the world. The descent into wickedness was so severe that it reached a point where God saw that everything human beings thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. This was also around the time where we find out about the strange creatures known as Nephilim. The Bible explains, In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. Things were clearly going very wrong and God was sorry he ever made mankind. He decided to wipe everything off the face of the earth and start again with a man called Noah. This led to one of the most famous biblical events where a great flood covered the whole earth and destroyed everything except that which was safe in the ark. Now, after the great flood in Genesis, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham had a son called Cush, and through the family line of Cush there came a man called Nimrod. The Bible reports it like this. The descendants of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The descendants of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Sabtika. The descendants of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Cush was also the ancestor of Nimrod who was the first heroic warrior on earth. Since he was the greatest hunter in the world, his name became proverbial. People would say, This man is like Nimrod, the greatest hunter in the world. He built his kingdom in the land of Babylonia, with the cities of Babylon, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne. From there he expanded his territory to Assyria, building the cities of Nineveh, Rehoboth-ir, Kalna, and Resin, the great city located between Nineveh and Kala. I include verses 6 and 7 in this reference because it's important to note the extra attention given to Nimrod in comparison with the other descendants of Ham. Even so, this only hints at his importance in the history of mankind. He was possibly the first king in world history. This is the first time the word kingdom is mentioned in the Bible. He was master and commander of a vast empire, the first man of renown, the first heroic warrior on earth. But when the Bible reports that Nimrod is the first mighty man in history, a fierce warrior and a great hunter, we should avoid being tempted into thinking highly of him because the Hebrew root of the word for mighty man actually translates into English as tyrant. The Jewish Talmud calls him a hunter of the souls of men and the famous Jewish historian Josephus also talks of Nimrod as a tyrant or dictator. Indeed, his name, Nimrod, literally means let us revolt or the rebel. And unlike the other descendants of Ham who mostly ended up in Africa or China, Nimrod, who it was believed was born in modern-day Ethiopia, 
headed towards the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. That's right, the exact spot where the Garden of Eden had been. The fact he was returning to the scene of the original fall of man to build his empire is significant in itself. He clearly meant something symbolic by it. Perhaps he was identifying with that scene of original rebellion. Perhaps he was metaphorically trying to build a new Eden by his own power and apart from God. Perhaps he was identifying with Cain by stubbornly returning to the spot that Cain had been expelled from. Perhaps it was all of these reasons. But it was here that he built the city of Babylon. He also built the city of Nineveh nearby and conquered the others that already existed in the area, thus creating his empire. As the first to learn the arts of war, Nimrod ruled and subdued his empire with an iron fist and was noted for his use of sorcery and fire to gain his victories. Like many men of renown in the ancient world, myths and legends arose around him to the extent that it's now impossible to discern which are true and which are not. You may recall a scene from Braveheart where the Scots are about to go into battle with the English, and many, upon seeing William Wallace for the first time, refuse to believe it is the man they have heard so much about. In the legends that have arisen around him, he is ten foot tall and can shoot fire from his behind. This is the kind of thing that surrounds the legends of Nimrod. What we can discern, however, is that he was strongly associated with fire, and that he used it in battle to strike fear into his enemies. This created an association with himself and the sun. Fire was seen to be the sun's earthly representation. We also know that he was sometimes represented as a bull, and that he probably wore a crown made from bull horns. The reason for this is that the Chaldean, or Babylonian word for ruler, was tour, which also meant bull. Finally, we should notice how closely the description of Nimrod matches that of the hybrid Nephilim. The words heroes, famous and warriors are used of both, and some commentators have suggested that he was of this type. Certainly these giant beings were a result of a demonic invasion of humanity and led to complete moral degradation, something that Nimrod should be associated with, as we will soon discover. <laughs>